What's up, people? Welcome to this episode of the By the Hood podcast or webcast, because I don't know how you're consuming this content. I'm your host as always. My name is Jimmy. And as we start off every show, that is with gratitude. Thank you to all of our supporters and every city from the By the Hood ownership camp. Um, listen, man, 2023 has been an amazing year for us. And I want to start off by saying happy holidays to everybody. Um, and we appreciate all the support, right? So we start off every show with gratitude. Uh, I'm Dolo here again myself today. This is the last show of the year. Um, you know, of course, with the family on holidays and all that. But I wanted to make sure we get out one more pod before the end of the year. And this is actually an important pod, um, being the last one for the end of the year as you can prepare for 2024. So having conversations within our community, because, you know, we talk, we talk to people every day all right, about what they're seeing, what they're looking at. Um, I thought this was a relevant pod to drop right before the end of the year. Um, we will be on Friday, our Friday live. Where we, you know, do our giveaway every week. Before I get started into the topic today, I just want to make sure that everybody, um, you know, does all the YouTube and stuff in terms of subscribing, sharing, you know, like, comment, all the good stuff to help us fight the algorithms. Again, we appreciate those that always do that for every episode or every piece of content that we drop on our YouTube channel. But we do have a goal in 2024 of, you know, possibly getting to 10,000 subs right now. We're, you know, approaching 7,000. So, you know, it's, it's close by. So we want to see if we can knock that goal out. But today we're going to talk about ETFs um, and why, you know, one of, you know, and again, I'm going to start by saying this. Let me back up a second. Anything I say on this episode is not investment advice. I am not your fiduciary. I am not giving any kind of advice. I am talking about my specific strategy, things that I do and looking at the market um, why I think that it's an appropriate conversation going into 2024. So the conversation is really about index funds or ETFs, um, you know, a basket of holdings and why that is my preferred method of investing. Um, you know, we do have classes that we've taught in the past. If you're a member of MDC strategy, you know that there is an intro to the stock market course that comes as part of the membership. Um, there's also an advanced stock market course where we go over how to break down companies, balance sheets and things of that nature. Um, which is important to have an understanding of why the market is the place to be in terms of making your capital grow. Now, with that being said, I am not one who believes that most people should be picking individual stocks. I've said it on a number of podcasts. I've been saying it for multiple decades, and I will continue to say this because what I understand is behavior, right? I can give you all the great examples of companies that you should have bought. Everybody good, is good for doing that. If you would have bought Microsoft back in 19 this, or if you would have bought Apple back in this and what you would have now, and all those things are true, right? But people like to cherry pick to give these scenarios in terms of what if you would have did this and then what you would have now. Um, the fact of the matter is you can't predict anything. At the same time, those were great investments. So was something like a Sears, right? Now, if you're someone that's going to get so deep into this game that you're going to follow the market, you're going to read the 10Ks, you're going to know what's going on with the company's balance sheet, that's a different scenario, right? But what, again, I'm, I'm looking at data. Everything to me goes, goes upon the data. What I recognize, the data says, most people won't do that. Most people don't have time to do that. Most people ha don't have the desire to do that. But I do believe everybody should have some of their money in the market because it's, it's one of the best growth engines that there is. Um, and we already participate in the market, um, but most of us participate as consumers and not producers or investors. So with that being said, the approach I always recommend are, you know, broad based ETFs or, or index funds. Right. So whether that's the S&P 500, the total stock market index. Um, and sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll even break down and go into a specific sector as it pertains to an ETF. But let me share this article and then, you know, further this conversation. And this article is from Reuters. Um, and, you know, so I'm going to put this article in the description as well as the show notes, you know, just to kind of give context to why I think this is a great conversation and what I'm talking about. Right. So this says, can sizzling magnificent seven trade keep powering U.S. stocks? So for those who may not know, and I'm not going to read the entire article, there's, uh, you know, um, a basket of companies called the Magnificent Seven. Um, you know, the first person I heard say that was um, Wall Street Trapper. I don't know if they stole that from him, but he said it a long time ago. So shout out to that brother. But uh, Apple, 
Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, NVIDIA, Meta, and Tesla are what they call the Magnificent Seven. I'm going to repeat that. Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, NVIDIA, Meta, and Tesla. And for those who don't know, Alphabet is Google, Meta is Facebook, right? Um, In 2023, those companies um, soared around 50% and 240% making them among the market's most rewarding bets. All are members of the S&P 500. The article says because of their heavy weightings in the S&P 500, the seven were responsible for nearly two thirds of the benchmark index's 24% gain this year. Not surprisingly, fund managers from Bank of America um, said that owning that, owning those stocks was the market's most crowded trade, but you know, there's, they're interested in seeing whether they can continue to hold the entire market up. Because what they're saying in, in, in so many words is these stocks are holding the entire market up. So it says the Apollo Group data shows that 72% of the S&P 500 stocks underperformed the index this year. That's a record. Let me repeat that, right? So the S&P 500, the Standard & Poor's 500, um, is one of our indicators of how our market is doing overall, right? the top 500 companies, 72% of them (laughs) underperformed, 72%, which means there's a small percentage in the S&P 500 that is holding the entire index up. So you would say, why don't I just invest in that small percentage? That's part of the problem. I'm going to get into that in a second, right? So the article says, however, there are signs that a rally is broadening, equal weight uh, S&P 500, has climbed 6.8% against 4.5% rise for the standard index after lagging most of the year, right? So a NASDAQ, another one, which would be the Qs, right? That That's also, um, you know, been performing very well. So then you also have the Russell 2000, which is small cap company. So there's different, there's different, um, not only sectors, but there's different indices that you can invest in. I always talk about the S&P because it's the one that most people have heard of, they have familiarity with. But um, I think that when you look at this, this kind of um, kind of makes my thesis make sense that the best thing to do is to get a broad based S&P 500 index fund or ETF and to spend most of your time just putting more resources into that and watching it grow because you don't have to worry about whether you have one of the magnificent seven or you don't. Right. Because those are the magnificent seven this year. Will they be the Magnificent Seven next year? I don't have a crystal ball, nor do I have the time to sit around and break down their balance sheets and get and, and, and go over the things that give them value. Again, I understand how to do so. We teach that, but we teach that from the standpoint of just getting a, uh, an idea of how the actual market works. Even within that course, we talk about most people should buy a broad-based index fund or ETF and just go mind their business. Figure out what it is that allows you to create value right? Take that value and buy the broad base and buy as much as you can. That to me is the cheat code is to really spend time, spend time in what you know how to do, right? So maybe your thing is the stock market. Maybe that is your gift and that's where you're able to create value. That's fine. But you aren't most people. You know, what if you are someone that's in medicine, you're in law, you're in education, you're an engineer. I would say spend more time, you know, mastering those skills, right? That will bring you value, that you can just go buy a broad base and you don't have to watch it. Here's why I say that, right? So recently I, I gave a, a continuing education class for real estate valuation. And one of the conversations that came in this continuing education class was um, the most valuable companies in the world. And we used the S&P 500 as the benchmark. And when we looked at those companies, what we realized is most of them are data companies, right? Because we were talking about real estate data. And I'll bring this up again. I just want to read those companies to you. Um, most of those companies are data companies, whether we're talking about Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're all data companies. So then we took a step back and looked at what were the most valuable companies in the eighties. Um, and for anybody who was around then, you know, what the answer to that was, the answer to that would be kind of like, uh, oil or energy companies, right? They would be energy companies. Those energy companies were at the top of the uh, S&P 500 back then. So this is why people have this this saying now that, you know, data is the new oil, right? Data is the new oil. The reason people say that is because it kind of replaced oil in terms of the valuation and in terms of where things are with value. 
So, you know, what will that be in 10 years? What will that be in 15 years? You know, will AI dominate the S&P 500? Will it all be artificial intelligence companies in 10 years? I mean, your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. But what I do know is if I own that broad based index and they, they, they tend to take over, I'll still have, you know, equity in those companies. Right. So the one thing to really understand about an ETF or um, buying an index is that it's self-cleansing. Right. If companies don't perform well, they are booted out. They do perform well. They are put in. Some of the most recent companies that just be added to the S&P 500 are companies like Uber, right? 10 years ago, Uber was in the S&P 500, but now Uber has performed in a way that puts it in the S&P 500. Same with Tesla, right? So by me just buying this index, I don't care what happens. Now, will I get the best results? Will I get the results of somebody who's able to just identify those specific companies that carry the index? Absolutely not. But what I will tell you is, most people who are active traders and investors don't beat the index anyway. And the reason they don't is because of human psychology. The thing about creating wealth in the market, um, something I come to realize just through experience, it's not about know-how. It's really about human emotion. Human emotion is what really brings down a lot of our uh, ability to gain growth within our portfolios because we end up doing too much. You know, we end, all of us think we're smarter than we really are. Right. And the interesting thing about this, this um, conversation and this advice is it's something that Warren Buffett has liter literally been saying for decades. I go back and watch his videos from his shareholder meetings, and he's literally been saying this forever, forever, forever. Um, just buy the S&P 500 and let it do its work. Right. Because what you're doing is you're saying that our country will continue to operate business as usual. That's what you're doing. Right. So. What I'll say is I kind of agree with that assessment. Um, I personally, um, VU is where I would say a majority of all my um, investment in terms of equities is in VU, not investment advice. Vanguard, S&P 500 ETF, that's where my personal my personal thing. Um, it's not that I don't own other ETFs, right? VNQ, which is the real estate ETF. NGK, I talk about that often on our Friday show, which is the growth ETF. So I have a couple other ones, but I would say even with those, it's small allocations to those. Majority of the allocation is to VOO. So, um, you know, I wanted to bring this video because I know a lot of people are preparing for 2024. And what we all talk about is, you know, health and wealth every year, even myself personally. Um, you know, I'm going to take my health a lot more serious going into 2024 and continue just to buy my S&P 500 index fund. So I think this is a great conversation because even at work, if you have a 403B, a 457, a 401K, any sort of deferred compensation account, a lot of times they'll have different types of funds or in, you know ETS or things you can invest in. But I haven't seen one yet that doesn't have an option that mirrors the S&P 500, right? Now, you have to look through the prospectus and find you know whatever one that is, but I have yet to see one. Um, that doesn't have anything that mirrors the S&P. So that's what I do. I, you know, get the fur comp, put as much as you human, humanly possible can. And, you know, now you're invested into those top 500 companies. The thing about it is, it's weighted. So Apple and Microsoft will be at the very top. So you'll have equity in the biggest companies. But here's the thing. If Apple fails tomorrow, not saying it is, Apple might dominate for another 30, 40, 50 years. Who knows? Can't predict the future. Don't have a crystal ball. But what I do know is um, if something else is at the top of the S&P 500, I don't care if it's the trucking industry. I don't care if it's the real estate industry, technology. Like I said, AI is the wave, whether it could be, you know, crypto companies dominate. Who knows what will dominate? But by me having the S&P 500, by being self-cleansing, I'm able to really not spend as much time, right? This is a great book. Uh, J.L. Collins is called The Simple Path to Wealth. You know, I always love giving book recommendations. He has two books um, about this strategy. His strategy is even simpler than what I'm saying. He buys, uh, I think it's VTSAX, Total Stock Market Index. Um, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> I mean, that's literally it. Uh, but he has two books. One is called Pathfinders and one is called The Simple Path to Wealth. And the author is J.L. Collins. Um, there's also another book 
that uh, I should mention is called the Three Fund Portfolio. I'm a the Bogleheads Guide to the Three Fund Portfolio, which breaks down some of these simplified ways of investing. This is very simple, and anybody can do it. And that's also what makes this a great strategy: is kind of simplifying the idea of finance instead of having to constantly watch CNBC or being. A, you can focus on where you add value. Again, this advice isn't for everybody because some people really do want to take it to the next level, and that's fine. Um, but I just want to make sure I have this conversation, explain some of the benefits of running the strategy. And also just look at the article that just dropped that talked about how those companies are carrying the entire index, right? So again, that's 2023, they carried the index in 2024. Maybe we can come back and um, you know really see if that you know, still remains the same. If not, we'll talk about what has dominated the uh, the actual index. But I think it's interesting to take a look back and look over years and see what industry is the dominant industry. Because for years, it was oil and energy. So those companies dominated, but technology is really where all the revenue and the money is at, data within technology. So, you know, um, I would love to hear you guys' thoughts on this, this approach of simplifying things only buying an ETF or index that represents the broad market and finding other ways to create more um, income to put into that investment. Now, being a thousand percent transparent, right? Um, It's not that I don't trade or do other things because I always do look for setups. I'm in the market every day, but, but even when I, you know, I'm trading, I'm trading with the intention of adding more to my long-term whole portfolio. And, I am not an over trader. I might make one, two trades a week, although I'm always looking at it. And the reason we have our group and we operate as a group is because we bring attention to each other. Like, hey, look at this setup. Look what this might be doing. So it really is a cheat code to also not having to be in front of a computer all day long because I don't have time to be in front of a computer all day long. I'm doing a, a gazillion things. But with that being said, I think that it's important for us to understand how markets work. And it's also important for us to make sure that we are participating in the system as investors and not just consumers, because we are doing business with all these companies, whether we like it or not. As a matter of fact, if you're watching this video, you're probably watching on, you know, (laughs) YouTube or Facebook, which are both part of the uh, Magnificent Seven, right? So I'm recording this and uploading it there. You guys are watching it there. So with that being said, we are all we are all and probably watching on on an NVIDIA chip somehow, some way. Um, so we are already participating um, with these companies. But now I want to talk about getting on the other side, but also doing so in a way where you're not risking everything because you're getting broad exposure and you're simplifying it. Simple simplicity is key. Simplicity is key. But give me your feedback. Let me know what you think about taking a simplistic approach to your finances. Um, what is something that you're looking to do moving into 2024 in terms of investing? And um, yeah, let me know, let me know anything that you think about, you know, what's going on here, right? Um, I know we've been talking about Bitcoin a lot lately, so I wanted to make sure I talk about this because you know, the way I see investing is very simple. I have a couple buckets, right? So my buckets are real estate, the S P five hundred, and Bitcoin. Those are my buckets. Go find ways to make money. Drop some in the buckets. Watch the buckets grow. The buckets continue to build themselves up. And keep it simple, right? Keep it simple. You don't need 50, 11 monitors, charts going everywhere. Like, and that's for the birds, man. Anyway, um, I want you guys to be safe. Have a happy and prosperous new year. Please make sure to continue to support. You know, um, we love all we love anybody that's like, you know, giving us positive energy in every way. Um, I know I could say that as well as my brother Corey feels the same way, man, because, you know, the work is what keeps us moving. Um, 2024 will be amazing. Our camp will be back in the summer for the youth, free camp for the youth. For, for those that may be just watching for the first time, every summer we do a free camp for the youth. And we talk we talk about some of this stuff. We talk about and what's an ETF and what's an index fund, right? So that, that'll be back in 2024. Um, A lot of other positive things in the community coming for 2024. And we'll continue just to, you know, drop some informative videos on our YouTube channel. Please make sure to subscribe, comment, like, do all the YouTube and stuff. (laughs) And with that being said, man, please, please stay safe out there during the holiday season. Love you guys. See you in our next episode. But as we always say, it's not about how much money you make. It's about how much you keep. Game elevates. See you guys later. Peace.